Hello everybody and welcome to Blockchain Expert. In this video, I'll be going over wallets. Now a wallet is really just your bank account on a blockchain network. It allows you to send and receive funds and then obviously to store those funds as well. So in this video, I want to break down how a wallet works and some different terminology related to wallets, how you would create them, how they're secure, and just pretty much the fundamentals around blockchain wallets. Now, I just want to preface everything here by saying that the fundamentals behind wallets are typically the same across different blockchain networks, but there may be different types of wallets or different properties of wallets depending on the blockchain that you're using. So everything I'm going to talk to you about here will apply to, let's say, 99% of different blockchain networks, and it will specifically apply to the network Bitcoin. However, it could be a little bit different. So just keep that in mind that all blockchain networks have differences and creating wallets and how wallets work on those different networks may not be identical to what I'm going to describe here. But again, usually the fundamentals are the same and it should be fairly consistent across different blockchain networks. Anyways, with that said, let's start diving in here and talking about some different terms that we need to go through. So the first thing we'll do here is kind of break down the architecture of a wallet and go through a few key terms and kind of how those terms relate to each other. So if we have our wallet over here, the three key terms that we need to understand are going to be the private key, the public key, and then the address. Now, all of these terms or all of these things are highly correlated to each other. It all kind of starts here from the private key. So what the private key is, is essentially the password to your wallet. It's the most important aspect of the wallet and it's the thing that you need to keep safe and that you cannot lose in any circumstance. If you lose your private key, you will lose access to the funds in your wallet and you'll not be able to well control the balance. You won't be able to send any transactions, you won't be able to access the wallet and neither will anybody else. So this is unlike a bank when we talk about blockchain networks. I can't just go and call someone and say, hey, I lost my password, I got locked out of my account. There's no way to do that when you're talking about cryptocurrency wallets. So if you lose the private key, key, which is the password to your wallet, then you have no access to the wallet. You can't do anything. There's no one you can call. There's no help desk. There's no support. It is physically impossible to access the funds if you do not have the private key. So make sure you understand that whenever you're creating a wallet, keep your private key safe, make copies of it, print it out on a physical piece of paper, maybe put it in a safe, have it on different devices, etc. You need to know what the private key is. Now, what the private key actually is, is a 64 digit hexadecimal string that is randomly generated. Now, you don't really need to know that exactly, but it's just a long string essentially of random numbers that is generated when you first create the wallet. Now, there can be an infinite amount of wallets on different blockchain networks, or at least most of them like Bitcoin. So anyone at any point in time can generate a private key, which will then kind of create the wallet for them. So that's step one. We have our private key, which again can be thought of as the password, and it is the most important part of the wallet. So do not lose the private key. Keep it safe, stored in many different locations, locations sorry, and do not share your private key with anybody period. Don't put it online, store it completely offline. So that is your private key. Now, another part of the private key is that typically the private key can be encrypted. So essentially what an encryption is, is taking some form of data. In this case, we have a string, which is our private key and kind of scrambling that data with some form of other data like a password. So what we would have is we would have our private key we would have actually a text password. So something that you would understand and that you would remember, we would kind of join those two things together and pass them through an encryption algorithm. And then it would spit out just a bunch of random characters that really meant nothing to anybody. Now, this is the encrypted data. Now, when you have your encrypted data, you would then need to decrypt that data using the password. So what would happen is we would take our PK, which is going to be our private key, plus our password, which I'll just say is PWD. Now, this password is typically going to be something that you would remember. It would be like a password you'd have for your Google account or Facebook or whatever, just some string, something that you're going to remember and that you can use to decrypt the private key. So we take this data and we pass this to some type of encryption function, and then it's just going to spit out a bunch of random characters, which is kind of the scrambled private key, and it's scrambled using this password. Now, once we have this random string of characters here, which is our encrypted private key, so we can just denote that with EPK. So let's go like that EPK for encrypted private key. The only way to actually use this private key or to get the original data would be to decrypt it. So to decrypt it, we would go the other way around. Let me just get rid of all of this on the screen here. We would now take not our private key, but we would take our encrypted private key. We would then pass the password, 
and then that would give us the private key. So we just run it through the same encryption algorithm, or I guess in this case, the decryption algorithm. And what it does is it takes the encrypted data plus the password and then gives us whatever that original string was. So we're decrypting it. So this is just another layer of security so that if someone were to get your private key, if it were encrypted, then you would need the password as well, which is something that hopefully you would have memorized and that again, you wouldn't share with anyone else. So that is the first and most important aspect of your wallet is your private key. Again, do not lose your private key. Do not share your private key. Do not put your private key online. Treat it just like it is everything. You need your private key. It's essentially like a passport or like a birth certificate or an ID. It's really the way that you own the funds inside of the wallet. OK, so we have the private key. We've gone through that. So now we move on to the public key. Now, as the public key states, this is public. This is something that you can share with people. And really what it is is a unique identifier for your wallet. Now, once we generate the private key, what we actually do is we pass this private key through something called a hash function. I'm going to talk about that hash function later on. But what the hash function does is it spits out a hash of the private key, which is actually the public key. So we have the private key. And from the private key, we generate a public key. And again, the public key is kind of the unique identifier for your account. And it's something that we give to people for them to be able to send us funds. Now, that's not exactly true because we have something called an address. But the public key is something that if someone had, it would be fine. They wouldn't have access to your wallet. So the basic process is you take your PK, right? You pass it to what's called a hash function. So we'll just say hash FN like that. And then the hash function spits out the public key, which I guess I can't write PK again because it's going to be the same acronym, uh, but this gives you the public key. So you have your private key, you pass it to a hash function, and it gives you the public key. Now, we will talk about the properties of hash function in a second, but what you need to understand here is that given a public key, it is extremely difficult, if not impossible, to find what the private key was that was used to generate that public key. Now, that has to do with properties of hash functions. Again, I keep saying we're going to talk about it in a second, but for now, just understand that the public key is generated from the private key using a hash function. And if you were to have the public key of someone's wallet, you don't have access to their funds, and it's next to impossible for you to actually determine what the private key was that was used to generate the public key. So the public key can be thought of as secure. OK, so let's continue here. I'm just going to leave the hash function up because we're going to use this in a second. Now we've talked briefly about the private key and the public key. The next thing is the address. So once we have a public key for our wallet, what we do is we feed that into a hash function again, and that gives us what's known as the address. So let's write this out. We have our public key, and then that gives us the address. So hopefully you're realizing by now it all starts from the private key. The private key generates the public key. The public key then generates the address. Now what the address is, is exactly what it sounds like. It is the thing that we give to people for them to send us stuff. So just like a house address, if you're having something mailed to you, this is exactly what it is here in cryptocurrency. This is what we're going to be publicly handing out to different people and saying, hey, this is my wallet. It is this address. Now, the address again is correlated with the public key. Now, the reason we generate an address is just because this public key again is going to be a random 64 digit hexadecimal string that is created from the private key. Now, that is very tedious to deal with and very difficult to kind of type out or just to use on a day to day basis. So essentially what we do is we run the public key through the hash function and this gives us an address that's in a much more readable format. Now, the length of the address can vary depending on what uh, blockchain network you're on. But on the Bitcoin network, for example, the address length is between 27 and 34 alphanumeric characters. Now, it's not important to know the exact length, but I just wanted to illustrate that it is significantly shorter. It's about half the length of the public key, and it just makes it much easier to use on the network. Now, what this also does is add kind of one more layer of security to your account. Now, the account would be kind of this whole thing, right, like to your wallet in general. And the reason for that is there is some ways of trying to guess what the private key is based on having the public key. So now if you add one more layer to this, so now you have an address that goes to a public key that goes to a private key or vice versa, private key to public key to address. Now what you would have to do is you'd have to guess the public key associated with the address and then you'd have to guess the private key associated with the public key. So rather than being able to just randomly guess a bunch of private keys and see if those match up with a specific public key, you'd have to do this two times. You'd have to guess a bunch of different public keys that line up with an address and then a bunch of private keys that line up with that public key. 
Now, I'm sure that's a little bit confusing because we haven't gone through the hash functions and how those work yet. Uh, but this is kind of the basic premise here of why we would have an address makes it easier to work with, adds a little bit extra security, but that's not really the main reason that we have it. And again, the address is what you're publicly giving out and what people are going to be sending money to. OK, so now that we understand these three uh, key pieces of terminology, I want to talk about hash functions and how wallets are actually secure, because right now it might seem kind of basic that we just have these three things, private key, public key address. And it may seem like the wallet is slightly insecure, especially if you don't understand how the hash function works and how we're generating the public key and the address, which we're giving out to really the public to be sending us uh, crypto. Now, before we move any further, I'll just quickly add that another reason we would have an address is because on some blockchain networks, you can actually generate multiple addresses. So from your public key, you can have multiple different addresses that all point back to that same public key. So that allows your account or your wallet to have different addresses that you would give out to different people and maybe receive different funds. So you can kind of organize those funds in some way. So just keep that in mind. You can sometimes have multiple addresses. Again, another reason why we would have that property so that we have the one main public key and then from that public key we can generate multiple addresses that we give out. Anyways, now let's talk about hash functions. So hash functions, this is what I was talking about before and kind of the basic security mechanism behind our wallet. So what we do is we take our private key, which again is generated when we create this wallet and we pass this to a hash function, which then spits out our public key. Now, how does this hash function work? Well, the first and most important property of a hash function is that it outputs something that is practically impossible to determine the input that was used to generate. So to illustrate what I mean by this, let's just say that we have some function and we're going to say y is equal to f of x. Now, x here can be our private key. So let's just say private like that. And y can be our public key. And then this function would be some type of hash function. So we just say hash function like that. And really, I probably should have drawn the arrow the other way, but you know what I mean. Okay, so we have our hash function, we have our private key, and we have our public key. Now, with a typical function, what you can do is you can find what's known as the inverse of that function. Now, the inverse of the function would be uh, written, sorry, f inverse of x is equal to y. But if you were using the original inputs, then really what you would do is you'd say f inverse of y is equal to x. Now, what this means is that given the output from some function, you can usually determine what the input was to generate that output. So what I mean by that is if we had a function, let's say f of x is equal to something like x plus two, then if we get some output from f of x, we pass say f of one and we generate three, it's very easy for us to determine given three and given the function what the input was to generate that. Now, the way that we would actually determine this inverse, I can solve it for you over here, is we would change this. We'd say y is equal to x plus two, where y is just the output of our function. We'd say, okay, we need to isolate for x. So then given y, we can determine what x is. So to do that is pretty straightforward. We just say y minus two is equal to x. And now we have what's known as the inverse function. So if you give me some y, which in this case is three, I would pass it to my inverse function, where I would then simply subtract two from it. And then that would give me x, which would be one. So I've determined the inverse. And now I know, given some output, what the input was to generate that. Now, the property of the hash function here is that there is no known inverse. So you cannot find f inverse of x or f inverse y, whatever you want to call it. It's just practically mathematically impossible to find that. Now, I'm not going to talk about exactly kind of how that works. Hash functions are very complicated and there's something you can look into in your spare time if you want to see the actual mathematics behind that. But for now, just understand there is really no known inverse. Now, that doesn't mean it's theoretically impossible to find an inverse. It just means that currently at this point in time for the hash functions that we use, we don't know what the inverse of those hash functions are and no human or no computer has been able to actually determine what that inverse is. So we're kind of just banking on the property here that there isn't a known inverse for these functions. But theoretically, there could be an inverse that we just haven't found yet. So kind of an interesting fact, modern day encryption, modern day uh, hashing, which is really the security or the basis of security on the Internet, relies on a property that is not completely proven that these functions don't have an inverse. Again, we haven't proven that. We just very highly think that that's the case and we haven't been able to find an inverse. All right, so that's the first property. You can't, from the output, determine the input. Now, of course, that's very important because if there was an inverse, then you'd be able to generate anyone's private key given their public key, and then the entire security of the blockchain network would be compromised. 
So since we don't have that inverse, given the public key, there's no easy way for you to determine what the private key was that was associated with that public key. So before I move on here, I will mention that even though it's really difficult to find the inverse and no one's been able to do that yet, there is still ways to try to guess what the private key is that's associated with a public key. So if you give me the public key, and you give me the hash function, my best method of guessing or determining what the private key would be is to simply guess. So what I would do is I would just feed a bunch of inputs here to this hash function, and I would essentially check if that input gave me the public key. So I would be trying to determine the private key by just guessing what it is and just feeding a bunch of guesses into f of x here, which is our hash function. And then if I ever get the same public key that I'm trying to find the private key for, I know that I found the correct private key. So hopefully that makes sense. You just pass a bunch of inputs to the function, but this could take, you know, millions of years, hundreds of millions of years. It could take an infinite amount of time because there's so many different possible strings that could be the private key. So to find one that aligns with a specific public key is very difficult to do. There's not many cases of people being able to actually guess a private key. So you can essentially just believe that your private key is secure and that if you give out a public key or you give out an address, they're not going to be able to determine what the private key is. OK, so that's the first property of hash functions, which is very important, is that there's no known inverse and it's very difficult to determine what the input was to generate the output of a hash function. Now, the next property of hash functions is that they're very fast to compute. Although these are complicated algorithms, uh, they don't take a long time at all. In fact, they're pretty well instant to compute. So you don't need to wait any amount of time when you're actually trying to say check a hash, which we're going to talk about later on. So first two properties, no, no, no known inverse, sorry, and very fast to compute. So the next property here is that hash functions generate an output that is uniform. Now, what I mean by that is that the output will have specific properties. For example, it will always have the same length. Now, we need to do that because when we're trying to generate, say, a public key, the public key needs to be a specific number of characters. So based on the hash function we're using and kind of how we tweak that hash function mathematically, we can make it so that it always gives us an output that is going to be the same number of characters or within a character bound. There's all kinds of different ways to modify the hash function, but we can generate some type of uniform output. So if I have something, say, like f of x here and I pass my private key, which again will denote with pk, even though I know that could be public key as well, then it will generate something that it's always going to be 64 hex characters, which is what we want. When I say hex, I'm talking about hexadecimal. All right, so that is the third property of hash functions. They generate some form of uniform output. We know it's going to be bounded to a specific length, for example. The next property of hash functions is that they are deterministic. Now, what deterministic means is that if I pass X to my hash function, it always gives me Y. There's never a chance that passing X gives me anything other than Y. Now, that's very important because when we have, for example, our private key and we're generating our public key later down the line, if we want to prove that we own this wallet, we want to say unlock the wallet based on having the public key of the wallet, we would need to pass the private key to unlock that, to access the wallet, right? So if it were to give us a different public key when we passed it to the function, uh, when we're passing our private key to the hash function, then obviously that would be quite bad. That would mean, okay, we used our private key to generate our public key. Now we have the public key, we want to unlock our wallet. But when I pass this back through the hash function to verify that I am the owner of this public key, it's giving me a different output. So of course, that's not good. It needs to be deterministic. Again, means same input always gives us the same output. And the reason I'm even mentioning that is because when we're trying to prove that we own a wallet, what we do is we pass our private key through the same hash function. And if it generates the public key, then that means that we're the owner of the wallet because we found kind of the password for this public key or we have the password. Right? We've used that to unlock it. OK, so that is the fourth property. It is deterministic. So the next property here is that hash functions have very rare, practically no hash collisions. Now, the reason I say very rare is because I can never tell you with certainty that a hash function is not going to have any hash collisions. However, it's practically impossible for that to actually occur based on the mathematics behind a hash function. But again, just like the uh, no inverse for a hash function, this is not a mathematically proven thing. So I can't tell you that hash functions have no hash collisions when it is theoretically possible that they could. It just doesn't really happen. Now, what I mean by a hash collision is when you have two inputs that generate the same output. So if x1 and x2 generate y, then that's a collision because both of these, in this case, it would be maybe private key or whatever the input is, is generating the same output. 
Now, you might be saying, well, doesn't this break the property of determinism? And no, it does not. The reason it doesn't is because if x1 always gives y and x2 always gives y, the function is deterministic. It's just the same input generates the same output. However, in this case, we have two inputs that both generate the same output, and that's a collision. So what I'm saying here is that it's very rare, practically impossible for a collision to occur. And I think you can understand why it would be a bad thing for a collision to occur when we're using hash functions. Okay, so that was the fifth property. The last property, or actually, I guess just thing to mention about hash functions is a bit of terminology. So we have our input, which is x. We pass it to the hash function, let's say f of x. And then what this actually outputs is what's referred to as a digest, the hash digest, the hash, the digest. There's many different terms that people will call this. It could be referred to as a hash, could be referred to as a digest, could be referred to as the output. But I just want to put digest here on the screen in case you hear people use that term. So when you generate the output from a hash function, again, it could be called digest, hash, output. Sometimes people mix the terms and they say it's the output hash or the output digest or the hash digest, et cetera. All right, that's pretty much all I had to go through related to hash functions. Now we'll just do a quick summary and then we can wrap up the video. All right, so just moving on here to a quick summary. We have our private key, we have our public key, we have our address. The private key is a random 64 digit hexadecimal string, at least in the context of Bitcoin, that is generated when we want to create a wallet on a blockchain network. This private key we do not share with people, we treat it like our password, and it's what allows us access to a wallet and to those funds. Now from the private key, we generate a public key using a hash function that has no known inverse. From the public key, we then generate the address. Now the address is meant to be a more readable version of the public key that we can give out to people to actually receive funds. So the public key will usually be a 64 digit hexadecimal string as well. Now that's a little bit difficult to work with and to be sending to people. So we kind of shorten that approximately by half here with Bitcoin. And we have now an address that's going to be between 27 and 34 characters, much easier to read, much more user friendly and generating the address adds a little bit more security because now if we want to get the private key associated with an address, we're one step further away from the private key. We need to generate the public key, then from the public key, get the private key as a opposed to if we were giving out the public key, then we would just have one step to go to the private key. Now, again, it doesn't really matter because it's next to impossible to go from the public key to the private key, but it just adds a little bit more security. One more thing is that we could theoretically generate multiple addresses from a public key. Again, depends on the blockchain network. So another aspect of adding the address kind of into the mix. OK, so that's really the basics on how the wallet works. Last thing, of course, is the hash function. We know the hash function has those properties. No known inverse, fast to compute, generates some type of uniform output. In this case, it has the same length. Uh, the hash functions are deterministic. They have very rare hash collisions. And the output of the hash function is referred to as the digest. So I'm just going to jump in here at the end of the video because I realize there's one more topic that I forgot to mention, and this is seed phrases. Now, a seed phrase is really a backup or recovery kind of code that you're going to be given and that you want to save in some secure offline location whenever you're using a wallet application. Now, these seed phrases come in a variety of different formats, but typically they're going to be 12 or 24 words. And these words are going to be words that you're familiar with from the English language. Now, in total, there's 2048 total words that can be chosen for this kind of sequence of 12 or 24 words. Obviously, the order is important. And by having these 12 words or these 24 words, which is referred to as your seed phrase, you're able to recover your private key or your kind of cryptocurrency account at any point in the future if you were to say lose access to your wallet. So it's very important that you obviously save these seed phrases, usually somewhere offline. You actually write them down on a piece of paper, put them in a safe or something along those lines. And having those, you can kind of regenerate your private key. So I'm not going to go into much more explanation than that. But again, you just are given these kind of 12 or 24 words. The order is important. There is a total of 2048 words. These could be kind of chosen from. And given these, you're able to go back to your private key. These are kind of an encryption of the private key, right? So you can kind of pass these words in. Um, it's not necessarily the right terminology, but you can kind of decrypt that, this phrase. It's going to give you the private key and then you've recovered your account. If you're curious to learn more, this has to do with something referred to as the BIP 39 standard. So you can kind of look that up and learn about it if you'd like to. Anyways, with that said, that is all I had for you on wallets. I hope you found this video useful and I look forward to seeing you in another blockchain expert lesson.